Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for October the 30th, 2020. This is episode number 30. Today, we'll be talking about driving Tesla full self-driving beta. Mini is getting some new all-electric models, and the Polestar 2 is getting recalled again. <laughs> I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, longtime EV owner and Inside EVs editor. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, which is available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from the Outer Spec Motoring and One Lap YouTube channels. He also puts together the awesome videos for the Inside EVs YouTube channel. Go subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. So welcome, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. All right, uh, so sometimes we talk about the cars that we have, uh, we happen to have charging in our driveways, but this week uh, we have to discuss a car that is no longer charging in our driveways. So I understand Tom, uh, Tom here has made a video about his Tesla Model 3 after 16 months of ownership and uh, 16,000 miles. Uh, so Tom, uh, uh, let's see. Do you wanna tell us what's going on here? Maybe a quick summation of your review and thoughts about the car um and what your plans for are okay great yeah so it's uh i've had my model three for about 16 months it's a dual motor long range and drove it about twenty one thousand miles a uh, little bit a little bit less and uh, some of the uh listeners here might remember in last week's podcast we were talking a little bit about the the new uh, model three that has the heat pump and some upgrades new center console longer range and I kind of made a joke about, yeah, I might have to get one of those. Well, I did. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I just thought about it for a couple of hours and said, oh, what the hell, I'm going to get one and put in my order and listed my car uh, online. And like the next day, I had someone at my house with $41,000 in cash. Said, Here, I want this car right now. And uh, I didn't even have the title uh, because I financed it. So they're like, I don't care. Um, send us a tile when you get it. This is the car I want. I've been looking for this spec and so forth and so on. And um, so here, take it. And we'll sign the contract and everything. So it happened really quickly. It kind of like caught me off guard. I was just kind of thinking about doing it. And then 48 hours later, my car was gone. And, um, <laughs> you know, it, it just happened really quickly. But sometimes that's the best way of doing it. Um, so you don't have regrets or second thoughts. So now I'm waiting. It's, it's six to 10 weeks for the new Model 3 to come in. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to it. It's, I think part of the reason why I wanted to do it, and maybe it's just an excuse for convincing my wife that I want to do it, is that <laughs> I think it's important that we have the new version because John Neff, our, our managing editor, has one of the uh, Model 3 like mine, with full, but he has the full self-driving option. He's not one of the beta testers, but it's good for the Inside EV staff to have the latest and greatest so we can do uh, or 70 mile an hour road tests, supercharging tests, all, all kind of stuff with it. So it does make sense. And here in New Jersey, we have a new $5,000 cash on the hood rebate for EVs that cost less than $55,000. So the, the, it's, it's literally going to be like three grand out of pocket for me. And I'm oh. getting a brand new car with no miles on it. That's better with the heat pump and everything. Um, there's one feature on it that isn't going to have that my previous car had. We're going to talk about that a little later. I'm not happy about it, um, and um, but that's right. another topic for us to discuss a little later in the show. Right. Um, oh, so uh, why? Uh, so it's like, tell us a little bit about what you think of the car that you, you've had for the last 16 months. So you know, were you, you're happy with the ownership experience, but. Yeah, I, I, really. I mean, I bought another one. You know, I, right. I uh, you know, the the car's not perfect. Not, not nothing is. The over there up, updates are are fantastic. I took a little bit in the video. I posted a video on my YouTube channel. That's a state of charge with Tom Malagany, and also then embedded it in the post on uh, Inside EVs. I took a little bit about some of the things. Like one of the things that used to bother the heck out of me was. Um, in order to uh, have the car lock when you walk away, you would check a box, you know, lock uh, when you when you walk away from the car and which you need because in public, when you leave the vehicle, you don't have a key. You want it to lock when you get 10 or 12 feet away from the vehicle. But then it would also do that at home. And, you know, I have a private garage where I pull in and um, when I would go inside the house, the car would lock and then I'd forget, oh, there's something in the 
trunk or in the in the in the the car that I have to get, and I'd walk out. And it would be locked and I couldn't get in it because I left my cell phone inside charging or whatever. Or if I just forgot to charge the car and I went out in the garage to charge it, I couldn't because it was locked. It drove me bonkers. It was one of the most annoying features on the car. But then like four or five months into ownership, we got an over the air update and boom, Tesla enabled a little checkbox to don't lock when it's at home. So, you know, the the over the air updates are fantastic. The car just keeps getting better and you just don't see that on on, on other cars. And, you know, we're critical of Tesla here. Tesla d- does a lot of things that drive us kind of crazy, um, but they still are ahead of everybody else. I mean, I almost wish that weren't the case, but it is. They still have the best technology. They're still making the best electric cars. And that's why I decided to get another one. I mean, there's there's other things. The efficiency is fantastic. I average 266 watt hours per mile over 21,000 miles. And I mean, that's better than what I averaged with my i3 before this. And the i3, BMW did everything they could to make that the most efficient car on the road. Now, granted, that was, it came out in 2014. Tesla had, you know, four or five years to, to improve things. So it's not really a perfectly fair comparison, but BMW is still selling that car and it's not more efficient than it was when they first launched it. So, you know, BMW put all their power and might behind building the most efficient electric car they could. And, you know, they sacrificed range by giving it a smaller battery. They sacrificed power. You know, it's, it's not that powerful. They've made, they had Bridgestone develop these like crazy skinny tires that only the i3 uses to like shave millimeters off the width of the tire so there was less wind resistance. They, I, I talked to BMW engineers about how they fought to save like 10 grams of weight on a on a component in the car. They fought the designers. And, uh, and, and then Tesla comes out with the Model 3, which is like, um, you know, a powerful, high performance sports sedan that goes, you know, over 300 miles and it, and it just blows away the i3 in efficiency. So, you know, it, it, Tesla really uh, to, has to be commended with, with, with that. I mean, there were some other th- things that bothered me a little bit. And I know I'm going to get beaten up about this because I keep bringing it up. But the Tesla mates of the, the, the sun visor clips are really cheap and plastic and they break frequently. Uh, as you can tell, if you if you really look at that picture we have up there, um, you can see the part that cracked. It's very thin plastic. And if you just pull down, and if you don't pull out, if you pull down by mistake, um, it just snaps off. So um, the uh, Model uh, 3, the new refreshed one, now uses the magnetic sun visor clips that the model was introduced for the Model Y. So, um, you know, that, that, that was like, that's what pushed me over the edge. I'm like, okay, uh, I'm not going to have to deal with these braking anymore. And I'm getting the magnetic clip. So I need to get a new car. <laughs> so, but, so, so you're talking about the uh, Model 3's efficiency, but this new one that you're getting, I understand we have EPA numbers up for it now. It's even more efficient. So, yeah, what do you expect to see? Exactly. Well, it's EPA rated at 353 miles. Mine, when it came out, was 310 miles. But then Tesla improved it to like 322 through software enhancements. But this new one now is 353 miles, which is crazy. And they're doing that, um, as far as we know, without making the battery larger. Um, You you know, uh, I I did see some speculation online that they're somehow we're squeezing more cells in there. I don't think that's the case, Um, uh, but it's still it's it's amazing. It's for it can go 14 percent further than mine could. And mine was only 16 months old. So Tesla increased the Model 3's range 14 percent in the last year and a half. Um, and, and you just don't see that with 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 no. other EVs. You know, they, they 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 a few of them have increased the range. Like the the I Pace now um, is is coming out with a with, with better range. But uh, Tesla is just just efficiency. They're just hammering in on improvements, improvements, improvements. And it's why I decided uh, to buy another one. So so one last question for me about this. Uh, so why get another Model Three and not a Model Y? Everyone's asking me that. Right? Um, yeah, you know, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, I don't need the extra space. The, the Model Y is great and it has a lot more utility and it's probably a better electric vehicle for families. I don't have any kids. It's just my wife and I. So we don't have to pile up, fill up the back of the vehicle with, you know, all kind of stuff and, and, and go around. It's just the two of us. So the ut- I don't need the utility. Number two, I'm not crazy about how it looks. Kind of looks like a 
a bloated Model 3. I, I, yeah. I'm not in love with it. I don't hate it, but I, I really like how the Model 3 looks. You know, so, you know, it, it's, I don't need it. Um, I don't, I don't love it. And um, te- I don't think Tesla has really nailed down the production, the manufacturing of that vehicle yet. They're still, um, you know, we still see reports of, of, of people getting them where like the, the hatch doesn't close. And the one that I got, the early model that I got, if you remember, we talked about this uh, a few months ago. Um, I got one of the first Model Ys to do range tests with. There's wires, the wiring harness hanging out from the, the front right wheel well. The speaker fell off on the, on, the, on the passenger side door. The rear hatch didn't close. When it came down, it kind of hit both sides and bounced before it latched. So, you know, Tesla... Tesla releases cars, quite honestly, before they're ready to be released. And it takes them a year to get the manufacturing process nailed down. We're still in that first year. And I know people are probably going to be commenting, says, oh, I got a Y and it's perfect. You're great. You know, I'm happy for you. And I'm sure there's plenty of them that come that are perfect. But there's still a higher percentage of them that aren't. Um, it's one of the reasons why I waited a year to get my model, my first Model 3. I let them nail down that 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 manufacturing and I think they're at a point now with the Model 3 where it's solid and they're making them, they're, a high percentage of them are coming out really well. So that's why, those are the reasons why I decided to stick with the 3. Right on. Um, all right. Hey, so I also understand that both Kyle and Tom spent some time uh, at uh, Lucid Motor Showroom this week, possibly in New York City. Uh, do you want to tell us a bit about that experience? Um, I believe you've seen the Lucid Air up close to before, both of you. This time, though, you could sit inside of it and maybe have a more refined impression of, of the actual like production version of the car. Uh, so, Kyle, do you want to tell us about uh, the things that really st- stuck out to you about it, about it this time around? Yeah, you're absolutely right. About, yeah, I don't know, six months, a year ago, something like this, uh, I sat in one of their early uh, production, uh, it wasn't even production, pre-production cars at their uh, headquarters in Newark, California. I believe Tom also sat in that same exact car. It had the executive rear seats, but it just didn't, like things were not as they should be. It was very early. Uh, This was as they should be. Um, Basically, Lucid invited us over to uh, Classic Car Club of Manhattan, which is a very famous car sharing, but also car enthusiast hangout spot in New York. Uh, Really cool place. Uh, Again, I grew up just outside New York City, so I'm pretty familiar uh, with that. And we basically went inside this room. They had cleared out this entire space to make room for two Lucids. Uh, They had a Grand Touring Edition, which you're looking at now if you're on YouTube, and the Dream Edition, which was uh, just behind this car. They had uh, their powertrain electronics, uh, motors, gearboxes, uh, uh, rolling chassis, everything there for us to see around this car uh, or, or around the showroom. And uh, we basically just had you know as much time as you want to go check them out, push buttons, see how it feels uh, materials wise. They weren't totally finished. Uh, the seats were not final uh, design, so sitting in the car um, didn't feel as cushy as I think it will. Uh, but but overall, it gave you a great impression on uh, just just seeing the cars. They showed off one in Zenith Red. Uh, the screens were really cool, and it was just a nice experience to spend some time with Lucids. I made a whole bunch of videos for a whole bunch of channels. Uh, one of them will be on Inside EV soon. I know Tom shot some interviews with the executive team uh, that will be on uh, on his channel. So we'll have a lot of cool content rolling out over the next, from my side, probably three months from that one experience. Right on. Hey, Tom, so what, what, what was your impression of it this time around? Yeah, so as Kyle mentioned, we didn't really learn anything new. Um, this wasn't an event to give us new information, but it was a, a good opportunity for us to sit down and talk with um, the engineering design uh, uh, executives, get some interviews in, and and we'll be putting some some videos together of that shortly. Uh, you know, the 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 big thing to me was that as you see up on the screen here, the loose we we got to see the new Zenith red color, which I think is the most striking of all the colors. That the air is going to be available in, and um, you know, when, when, while we were there, um, the their their PR was kind of like, yeah, I think this might be the first time, uh, you know, anybody's posting pictures of this. So I'm not sure they weren't 100 percent certain of that, but um, I don't remember seeing this this color out anywhere. And um, we went with that that this was the first time it was shown, and nobody has seen to 
say that that's incorrect at this moment, but who knows, a, a picture might pop up at some point. But I thought it was absolutely stunning and uh, got to talk to, you know, like I said, uh, Derek, Jen- Derek Jenkins and also Eric Bach of Lucid. We learned uh, nothing really new, but we did get uh, some, some good amount of information that we're going to put together and, and uh, create some uh, videos on Lucid. In, in person, um, the production version definitely is, is it's, it's ready to go as it is. It, as as, as um, Kyle mentioned, we did sit in the vehicles previously and you could tell they were just kind of like pre-production concepts. It, you know, Lucid, Lucid has it put together now. It looks like this is ready to go into production. We're hoping to get some time in uh, Lucid factory tour, which could happen sometime in early, uh, uh, 2021, or I was kind of pushing to see if we can get in there. And uh, it looks like they may be willing to do something like that. They said one thing that I did learn is they're installing the the uh, robots on the uh, production line in the next month or two. So all that all that equipment's getting put in there. And I think they wanted to make sure that um, the place looked a little bit more ready to go before they uh, brought uh, media in to uh, check it out. Because I think it's important for people to see that Lucid's factory is, is they have a factory, they have a production line, they have equipment in there. Because if you notice, we still get a lot of comments that, oh yeah, I'll believe it when I see it, you know, and vaporware, and this isn't going to happen. I think a lot of it's coming from like the hardcore Tesla fans. But, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm confident at this point that this is happening. Lucid's going to build this car. It's going to be available in, the, in, you know, the Q1 or Q2 of 2021. And uh, they're not going to be one of those companies that, you know, had a lot of promise and then just never built the car. Right. They're going to at least get the car out there and soon. Yep. Yeah. All right. So digging into the news, I see we have a few items involving Tesla, but uh, let's start with this first. Uh, Kyle, I understand that you've driven the new beta version of the full self-driving suite. Um and there's lots of videos online as well of other people trying it out. So, but what are what are your impressions? Oh, that's a loaded question. Well, I think we I mean, should first start explaining yeah, what this it. is because we haven't talked about yeah, it on the the podcast yet. And this is a uh, you know everyone knows that any Tesla built after October 2016 has their uh, uh, basically claim that the hardware can be full self driving, and that's eight cameras, a radar up front, and 12 ultrasonic sensors. Uh, the Model 3 and Y have an interior camera, but it does not seem like that's in use yet uh, for, for anything practical that would adjust the driving. So nine cameras in Model 3. And uh, Tesla has been saying for years that they would finally be able to show off full self-driving, and it just never came. <laughs> and you know, my car can't even do a quarter of the things that they say it should do. I, and and with that said, this comes with a huge asterisk that I love autopilot. Absolutely love it. Use it all the time. An amazing system for on highway assisted driving, but by no means was it ever full self driving. So uh, they rewrote the whole code. They got things uh, going on the back end and they said, okay, we need to show the world, I guess, uh, what we're working on. And so they hand selected, you know, the top Tesla fans that would give them the best press. I'm being uh, totally uh, down the middle on this one. They did not select anyone that was ever really that critical of Tesla. It was the president of Tesla owner clubs. It was, you know, the biggest Twitter account fans. It was YouTube content creators and, and people that in their eyes would probably be a little bit open to the system, uh, uh, you know, failing is the best way to put it. And, uh, you know, I have a friend with this system. Uh, he knows that I am, uh, very concerned about the safety of these types of things being rolled out to people. Uh, meanwhile, as a user, love it. Amazing. Uh, but uh, I said, let's let's try out this new system. I'm really excited to see, you know, all of this years of promise. How well, how far have we come? Uh, I did not watch any videos on the FSD before I drove it because I just wanted to get in and experience it for myself. And um, it was, uh, first off, a, an initial impression of, wow, this is one of the coolest things ever because the vision system can pick up almost uh, everything going on around you. So when you're driving in the car, it 
accurately recognizes pedestrians. That's the most impressive part. I don't think it missed a human the entire time I was driving, and that's really important. It did a very good job with cyclists. It did a very good job with recognizing parked vehicles and cones, cones it's been doing for a while. Uh, it even recognized the Kia Soul as a trash can, so it was very accurate there. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it is it is uh, an interesting vision system. So I think it can see the environment pretty well. Now, what is it doing with that data that it's seeing is where I'm a little bit concerned. Um, you can see uh, all of these little boxes around the car and the screen, if you're watching now, tend to lag behind the actual vehicle a little bit. And that's the reason I went with this four camera setup in my video. Uh, and people were very upset about this video, by the way, because I wasn't putting in-car audio in. And while we didn't say anything bad and we were generally very impressed, um, whether it is my friend who let me drive the car or Tesla, most likely my friend is very conservative about what gets shown uh, to the world with this system. And he doesn't want to lose his early access. And I totally uh, agree with this. Uh, I, I told him, look, I don't want to put you in any position that, that affects your standing with the early access program with beta testers. I will do as much as you let me do. And he said, okay, you can film, we'll review the footage. If the car touches anything, hits anything, if it uh, does anything that can be construed to harm the company in a massive way, we're not going to post it. So I had to agree to this. It's not what I wanted to do, but I did. Uh, and, and thankfully, we did not cut anything out of the video. The car didn't do anything egregiously bad, but we did keep the in-car audio out because there are certain sound clips where it's like, whoa, we're getting close to the curve. Let me take over. Like, what the hell is it doing now? It's swerving all over the place. Uh, you know, these are things that we just thought uh, or he felt that could be snipped uh, into small bits and used against the company massively. If it were up to me, I would have left them. But the overall driving experience or riding experience was, uh, I would say, poor. Uh, very, very poor, actually. It wasn't even close to being somewhat good in it for me uh you know we're driving around raleigh north carolina this isn't california where the cars seem to be working much better uh, i believe this is the only car in north carolina with this system uh and it was having a very rough time uh navigating tight corners it would get very close to curbs you can watch this all in the video again i'm not saying anything that's not in the video uh and and i think i'm being very fair in my assessment i had to take over many times now in the video it doesn't look like things are actually that bad but we're sitting at a stoplight the wheels are turned this way there's a curb right there and it's like uh okay zeb said you know if you listen to the raw audio which no one has access to he's like if you curb a couple wheels it's fine so then I let it go and we're driving over curbs. Literally the car is poof, poof, over them. And I'm like, okay. Uh, the left turns, it seems to have the most amount of problems with some, it executes perfectly. It waits for pedestrians. There's one in particular where we were turning left, a pedestrian crossed, we waited and then it went. Another pedestrian right after that moment was getting into a parked car. It moved over, let it go by. And we're like, wow, this is pretty good. That was amazing. Um, but then another time we're making a left turn from the right lane, uh, crossing two lanes of traffic, you know, granted no one was around, so I let it do it. And then it decides halfway through the maneuver, no, I don't want to go into the far right lane to turn left. We're going into the far left lane and chirps tires to turn that hard. And it's huge G forces on the car. Right. Right. Uh, so, so it's an early beta. You need to pay attention and that's fine. I, that's where the system is today. I, I don't think anything is wrong with that. Where I think my biggest issue comes is in the two areas. First off, it's driver monitoring system. You can't just use a torque sensor on a wheel to measure the cognitive ability of the human behind the wheel to adjust to driving situations around you. Even eye tracking that Volvo, Ford, uh, GM are, are, is using, this is not uh, even perfect. There are new uh, startups, for example, that are working on measuring your cognitive ability through many different sensors to see not only are you looking, but are you processing what's going on? And that's, you need to, because these systems are not hands off, mind off. Uh, the second area, that I think Tesla really needs to do a lot of work on is customer communication and education. There was no extra training. These drivers did not go through a safety training course. It was just loaded onto their cars and good luck. And they had a 10 minute phone interview that says, don't say anything that will harm Tesla. 
Uh, you know, and that makes sense. And they will all agree because they're big Tesla fans and I get it. That's okay. Uh, if they said the same thing for me to play around with it on my car, I would say, okay. And I would abide by those rules. Is it, uh, would I be considered an accurate journalist in the state? No. Uh, and I would say, I'm not even able to report on this system accurately because I'm keeping it nice for my friend. Um, I just think it's ludicrous that normal people have access to this type of system without any training. And, um, I really hope Tesla focuses on the safety on this type of system. The functionality, the vision, it's all there. It's going to start to be able to do some really interesting things. You just have to pay attention. That's my take. I always feel like, so they've, they've rolled this out to, like you say, uh, uh, some high profile YouTube uh, Tesla in influencers for the most part. They're actually, there was a, I've seen a few names that I thought that I, were, I wasn't aware of and I thought I knew everyone in, like, in that part of the Tesla community, but I did see a few uh, names of uh, uh, beta users that I didn't recognize. So it's not just the top ones. There's some other people as well. And maybe there's people that we don't know about as well. I don't know. Um, but I did think it was kind of odd. I've been thinking about this for a while now. That's a, at first, I, you know, it's thought it was kind of cool that they, you know, that customers have this. But then I, I watched a bunch of videos and as I could see exactly or get a better idea of exactly where the system's at. And I'm not, you know, I'm not exactly sure that it's ready for beta testers. I almost feel like, you know, may, and maybe this should be rolled out to a, like a hundred or so Tesla employees. Cause it's like, they have to train the system. Like, like you said, the, the elements seem to be all in place. It's like, I watched a video of it doing a number of roundabouts and uh, you know, sometimes it did pretty well, and then sometimes not at all. You know, it's like stopping at, at yield signs, and then maybe it's in the wrong lane, and it's the, the turn signals so or indicators, indicators are, are on the wrong the side. Uh, uh, the big the thing here is, I, I think I need to make it clear: the system itself does not inherently make the car unsafe. Uh, because the human driver is meant to be there to take over. It is just like normal autopilot. Uh, nothing is really different in that particular scenario. Where it becomes dangerous is when the driver behind the wheel says, oh, it just did the last four corners great. Let me go pull out my phone or look somewhere else and not pay attention. And that's when accidents occur. It happens on regular autopilot very infrequently, but also on the highway, things aren't really zigging around you. You don't have much cross traffic uh, as much. And so the, the, the danger comes from Tesla not explaining how to safely operate the system. They give you a warning that says it might do the wrong thing at the worst time. And that's it. And then, you know, if my mom got this system, right, which someone eventually is going to be able to buy a Tesla off the lot and drive away with this, she would have no idea when to take over. Is the car actually going to complete that maneuver? At what point do I take over? Do I need to pay attention all the time? None of this is explained. It is just expected to be known. And granted, the early testers, I think, are assumed to understand a lot of this, uh, to, you know, technology, and they have a lot of autopilot experience. So I think it's probably fine. I don't think we will see any major accidents, anything major happening with the initial rollout. Um, and then, you know, the other question comes, is this enough to show, uh, you know, to people who have purchased full self-driving, which is now $10,000 uh, feature complete? Is this all they needed to do? And then they'll pull it back and work on it for the next two years. We don't know what the future looks like. I hope that's not the case. I hope we see it improve and let people experience it. But I think you need Tesla, not you, but Tesla needs to be very upcoming uh, and forthright and uh you know, very transparent about what the limitations are and what is expected and required of the human behind the steering wheel. It, it certainly seems like it has a lot more learning to do, and I'm not sure the speed of it. I did see a couple clips where it would make a pass, like through a roundabout, and, and make a mistake, and then they repeat the thing, and it didn't make the, the mistake the second time. Well, it made it was, but it still wasn't perfect, and it it still seems like it's. It needs to be a lot better before it's rolled out to general people because if people start assuming it's capable of more than it actually is, it could leave the problems. Tom, Tom, have you seen watching any of these videos? Yeah, and, and you just said it needs a lot of work before it's rolled out to general people. They just rolled it out to general people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> these, right. th these influencers and Tesla fans aren't like experienced engineers or Tesla employees. 
you know, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of with you guys on this. Um, I think it's great. I think, you know, it, 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 this is an incredibly difficult process and, and, and uh, so much engineering has to go into it. But I, I think it's just nuts that they just gave this to people that don't have any experience and just kind of said here, you know, um, you know, don't don't say anything bad about it. But but post yeah. all the good stuff on social media. It's just a publicity stunt. You know, it's disappointing, in my opinion, to have Tesla do that. I think they kind of had to eventually because for the last three years, Elon's been saying by the end of the year, we're going to see feature complete. You know, we're going to drive coast to coast by the end of the year in, in 2018, by the end of 2019. Now it's the end of 2020. At some point, you had to just say, oh, look, we put it out and this is how they decided to do it. Um, I think it's disappointing. You'd never see any automaker do anything like this. Um, you know, and, and Dom, you said earlier that you would have preferred if you, you know, 100 or so Tesla engineers, you know, were, were, were doing this. I mean, that probably happened already anyway, you know, but but maybe instead of that, it should be expanded to 500 Tesla, you know, employees or people that were trained on the system to take these cars all around America, not just in California, drive the hell out of them, put on 10 million miles, you know, before you just give them to some influencers. I, I think it's nuts, you know, uh, or honestly think it's nuts. And Kyle's probably been, you know, the most, uh, you know, level-headed or straightforward with, with, with this. I mean, we've seen the videos. There's a couple of them out there that, you know, they say dude more times than a Keanu Reeves movie and um, are just really super excited and, and, yeah. uh, and you know, and, and I understand because it is kind of cool to be in a car where it's making lefts and turns and stopping at, at traffic lights. And, you know, roundabouts, even if it can, it, even if, yeah, roundabouts, even if it can do that stuff 75% of the times, that's incredible and really cool. But 75% doesn't cut it. 90%, 99% doesn't cut it. You know, mm. it, you know, if, if people are really going to be, you know, as Kyle said, that the problem is, you know, they'll get, you know, complacent and comfortable because it's doing so many things well that they go pick up their cell phone or reach in the back to get something out. And that's when something happens. Listen, I've had it happen to me with basic autopilot on my cars, which I love. It's fantastic. But there's been times where, I've momentarily let my guard down and then had to be like, oh, crap, you know, there's a, a, a concrete divider coming up and and uh, and I, I have to take over. And I'm pretty and I know the limitations. So I'm watching. But I, the honest thing is, even I get complacent because it's doing so well for so long. You're on a four hour drive and it's so easy to just take a minute to, to, to do something and not be constantly looking at the road. So that's, that's the, that's the danger to this. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's great that Tesla's pioneering this and I don't want to be that hard on them because I, what they're doing is incredibly difficult and it's, they're pushing this forward. They're going to get us to autonomous driving perhaps faster than other manufacturers are, but this is a tough way to go about it. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. I, I hope nobody gets hurt. And by the way, your take on this, go ahead. By the way, I didn't check the full self-driving package. And I could have, when I ordered mine, I could have gotten it for the 8,000 because I ordered mine before it went up to 10,000 and I'm still not buying it. Yeah, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Uh, The other take on this that I think uh, might be a good thing, more or less, is if the system was so good and it really manage to get around most of the time in inner city environments just like it does on the highway currently but the one time it messes up you're complacent not paying attention i don't think you can even get complacent with this system you are forced to pay attention uh it is so um again this is based off of my only experience with it in raleigh north carolina in a no tesla with this software had ever driven on those roads before this isn't California. Our roads are a little weird. They're hard to navigate. It's a tough city to get around, but so is every city. Uh, if the system was so good, you might become complacent and actually have an accident. At least it's bad enough <laughs> where it forces you to pay attention. And then it's kind of fun to just watch the car work as long as you're one with it. I do want to mention the system will only operate up to 55 miles per hour. Oh. After that, it will then switch to the 
normal autopilot that everyone has. For example, it does not turn on on highways. It's back to normal autopilot for that. And the other limitation was, it's, it's actually not a limitation, the last point was on rural roads where you're under 55, there's not many cars around, you're making lefts and rights out in the country, like where I live in, in a small city uh, with not much traffic, it's very good. It's just when you get cross traffic, pedestrians, cyclists, other cars, many lanes, some roads are one way, it thinks it's two way, uh, it gets very, uh, it's, it's tough and that is a tough environment but it is a definite improvement on some of these uh, higher speed suburban areas that I think I've seen most people testing. Again, I went in the heart of a major city and tested it there because that's what it's branded to do. Sure, yeah, that's a good test. Yeah, hey Martin, do you have some thoughts about this? Well, uh, I think um, it, this is incredible technology. So it's, uh, it's, it's, this is, <laughs> can you tell I'm tense already talking about it? Um, I had comments, listeners to my podcast this week say to me, um, why are you so critical? And you know, you're a Tesla hater and that's cra crazy. I've said so many amazing things about the company and this is incredible technology. So, um, I, the point I'd like to make is that there are so many people who haven't done the deep thinking about this in the kind of in the EV world, and they shouldn't have to, but they idolize Elon Musk. And when he says in 2019, there'll be robo taxis at the end of 2020, they believe him. And the point is that in 2018, somebody lost their life because an autonomous vehicle hit that person. And in the report afterwards, a portion of the blame was put on a distracted driver. And my biggest fear is that the worst happens again. And we just need to make sure that what we talk about here is a two ton vehicle m moving down the highway at, at quite fast speeds and to not think this is magical. This is incredible technology and this is brilliant. But I think people buy in to the, the wonder the wonder of like the, the the showman side of Elon, not the genius side or the super brain or the rocket launcher, but the showman side, the P.T. Barnum side of Elon Musk, where, you know, we're going to go to Mars and cars will drive themselves and it's going to be brilliant. And we love him for that. But I think there are so many people out there who think this is ready and don't want to deal with the really boring practical side of it's nowhere near ready and possibly won't ever be the corner cases for self-driving. Like, just think about it. I, like, if you're a driver, if you're a driver, you've done this. You've been driving down the road, and maybe you've been getting to a pedestrian crossing or a car, and just something in your head, like, just like this weird sixth sense gut reaction, just the body language of the person, they're about to walk. And you think to yourself, that person's going to go, aren't they? Like, there's like they're standing still, but there's something that you, they're going to walk, aren't they? And your foot's already hovering over the brake, and then they go, they step out because they haven't seen you, and you're already slowing down like that. <laughs> like we've all done that. You've gone, oh, you, you idiot! Like whatever, what, whatever. Like self-driving systems might get to that stage one day. I don't know when we're all ruled by the robots, but we're so far away from the nuances of 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 driving. And I say all of that with the utmost respect of the incredible work that Tesla's done. So we're in this weird situation where the minute you say anything negative, like my Twitter just filled up and like my YouTube comments of people just saying, you hate Tesla, like you hate Elon Musk. It's like, oh my goodness, like I'm in awe, this admiration of what we are. But what I hate is people say to me, like, oh, robo taxis are, uh, are going to be here by the end of the year because yeah. Elon said. And you're like, Argh. I find that fr I find it frustrating, and I find it annoying that we don't have that level of uh, that depth of conversation around a, a machine driving itself. We're just like, hey, it's cool, it's amazing, and our cars right. fart. And you're like, these are two separate <laughs> things, right? They're two. So that's my yeah. take. It's it's kind of like human nature, though, you know, because Elon does do a lot of, you know, interesting and great things, like landing rockets on ships in the middle of the ocean like that. Like 10 years ago, it was like, no, <laughs> that's ridiculous. You know, so, he, so when people see him do, like, amazing things, they, I guess we just assume that sometimes he can do everything he does will be amazing and every 
tweet he does is a work of art, but you know, that's not really the case, but yeah. And yeah. So I'm not sure if there's anything else we want to say about FSD beta right now. Anyone right now? Anyone? No, I love my Tesla. I love Tesla. Please don't come after me in the comments. I've already gotten so many. So, you know, it's, it, it is nothing to do with that. I, I literally cannot drive anything but a Tesla because it is the only vehicle that works for what I do. I think that's the highest praise. They are killing it right now. Uh, but this is dangerous. And I don't know any other way of saying it. You need trained safety drivers. The technology, like Martin said, incredible. It can drive itself for the most part uh, around suburban areas. That's cool. You still got to pay attention though. Uh, but it's just not, I think the only reason I'm being so uh, middle of the road, not excited is because everyone else I've heard said, this is the most amazing thing ever. I don't know how you can experience this system and come away with that conclusion. Yeah. It definitely needs a lot. There's a lot of work that needs to go on, you know, it's like, yeah, all over. And it should be interesting too. And even they had still have, they still haven't rolled up the, uh, the teaching software. I mean, they have their own like dojo learning kind of mm. thing where that's machine learning, teaching them how to, you know, do it self-driving driving better. better. Right. Yeah. But we believe from what I've heard that the system is adapting to the same scenario in different ways for different yeah. attempts like this roundabout scenario that you talked right, about right. earlier that means one of two things it's actually getting better or the system's just seeing different things every time it approaches the same spot right but okay so we'll leave it at that for the moment but we had to do some other tesla things to talk about real quick we yeah we're already chewed up some time uh so the the california automaker is about to embark on some serious service center expansion uh they've added 20 service centers over the past few months or so, and uh, they're going to continue to add them uh, next year at a rate of about one per week. So Tesla vehicle deliveries have grown about 50% over the past year. And I think it, over the past years, actually, it's, it's been doing like 50%. But uh, so the service center growth has been about 12% over the past year, and the mobile service fleet about 8%. I'm not sure if those things need to be like how close they need to be adding, adding up. But Tom, I haven't heard much in the way of uh, negative anecdotes about service centers being backed up and taking long periods of time to fix things like I did a couple of years ago. Uh, have you been to a service center recently? And if so, did they seem like slammed? Or are these service centers coming more likely to be a new and expanding markets? So I haven't personally needed to go to a service center, but I do have uh, a couple of friends, one in particular that had to have service done. And he was told that he couldn't bring it in for um, almost two weeks. It was like uh, 12 days or something like that, which, you know, isn't unreasonable. I mean, you, you would you would think that most um, in, uh, most dealerships wouldn't uh, be backed up uh two weeks if you had a traditional, a car from a traditional OEM. So yeah, you know, the thing is that Tesla sales have exploded so much. They're, they're, they're putting the cars on the streets has far outpaced, I think, their ability to service the cars. And while it hasn't been creating huge problems, it will if they don't continue to scale up. Now I have a, um, uh, my wife's uncle was thinking about buying a Tesla. Tesla. He lives in, in uh, upstate New York. And, uh, and he decided not to because he, he, he looked at his options for, for servicing the vehicle and, and it wasn't good. You know, he, he didn't have anywhere that was within an hour or two of, of, of where he lives and works and, um, or just at that hour, hour and a half um, uh, drive. And, and, and instead, he went out and bought a BMW uh, 530e plug-in hybrid. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, it, it is an issue for people, especially new customers, they're going to take a look around where they are. And if they live in some of the more, a little bit, slightly more rural areas and say, hey, there's no, I can't get this car serviced without putting it on a flatbed for a, a couple of hours. Um, you know, it's, it's going to, it, it's going to deter them from buying the vehicle. So I think it's a good move. I think they need more service centers. And, uh, you know, I'm, happy, I'm glad to see that they're going to step up the, uh, you know, construction of these. Right on. I'd like to add to this one quick thing. While we were talking, I went to actually go and schedule service for my car uh, here in local Raleigh, Durham area. And I wanted to see what the next available appointment was. Six months ago, maybe eight months ago, it was at least a month or a month and a half out. Long time. They since moved from a little tiny service and sales split center 
to a massive single building that houses sales and service. And service is huge. This used to be an old gym, like one of those Planet Fitness things, but it's massive. And if you cannot believe this, this blows my mind. We have a ton of Teslas in our area, believe it or not. Like they're everywhere on every corner. I can get service tomorrow morning at 8.45 a.m. is the next available, uh, which is just uh, amazing to show the progress that they've made. I mean, that is uh, so good. And uh, you know what? They've been really good to me. The service team, when I drop it off, their whole new process is basically remote. I show up, I drop the little key, I push something on an iPad, and then an Uber shows up and takes me away. Uh, And it's just total hands off. It's really nice. Really good service experience. I've never actually had a bad service experience from Tesla. I've had things where they forget to fix things on the list, but that's not a Tesla problem. That's the individual person that I was working with that just didn't complete that item. And so there's one outstanding right now. I can't move the passenger seat angle on my car, Uh, but that's not Tesla's fault. That is the mobile service. They did offer to come to my house and fix it. We just haven't been here long enough to schedule a day. Yeah. Well, some of that comes down, comes back to like initial quality or just, just general quality. You know, if you make good cars out of the factory, you don't need as many service visits, you know? Yeah. And this problem, by the way, was, was our fault. We damaged the car. Uh, We slammed the door into it. I think Alyssa had a hairbrush down there and it ripped the button off. Uh, So it's not a quality issue with the car. This was totally on us. Right. And, and that, oh, no, also worth saying though that every penny they spend on service comes out of their bottom line like the mm-hmm. the who runs tesla service is tesla like the people that make the cars that, that yeah. because it's it's there's no franchise so it's in their interest to to get it right in the long term there's other things as well like i don't know anyone who's ever bought a tesla that's gone back to another brand of car there must be some obviously interesting that you know that Tom sold his Tesla and bought another Tesla. And I think if you get service wrong enough, you end up getting to that point where somebody will say, well, I got rid of my Model S and I got a Mercedes Benz. And they never want to get to that point. I don't, they're not at that point now, but it's a potential if you mess up service for people who drive more premium cars. They're nowhere near that at the moment, I don't think. And so it's such good news that they're investing in that, that aftercare, which doesn't necessarily get more cars out of the door but it does create brand fans who will then become evangelists to all of their friends so it's a more subtle form of smart investment right so so speaking of investments in the wake of uh, tesla's third quarter financial reporting it's been discovered that they're about to sink a huge amount of money into the machines that build the cars and batteries namely gigafactories um according to the tesla's 10q which is about to file with the securities and exchange commission the sec um tesla expects its capital expenditures expenditures to be at the high end of our range of 2.5 to 3.5 billion in 2020 and increased to 4.5 to 6 billion in each of the next two fiscal years so that adds up to a total of 15.5 billion dollars including as much as 12 billion in 2021 and 2022 uh, now we know that it's still building uh, parts of its shanghai factory and even though it's been producing the model 3 for months now and the berlin and austin gigafactories are are in relatively early stages of construction and in this year they also also put together the 4680 battery pilot production facility uh martin do you think uh, these projects account for most of this outlay or is this Is this going to fund some other projects that have yet to be announced, do you think? I don't think there's anything on the cards that we don't know about. It's just simply the the sheer pace that they're they're doing it and the money that they can throw at it. Uh, And I said last week they could spend five billion on on capex on capital expenditure a year and it wouldn't touch the sides they'd still be a profitable company and and then a few days later they came out and said well that's <laughs> you underestimated by a billion dollars and you know six billion a year is is just incredible money to throw uh, at, at these it's a huge amount of money to throw at these projects and 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 that's per year so when we talk about i always say like you know ford are doing an amazing job because they're they're talking about the electric f-150 the e-transit blah 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 blah, blah and they know ford's 11.5 billion dollar investment in electrification and then i sometimes forget to remember over what time period is that so when you look yeah. at uh, the the compressed nature of how quickly they're going to spend this money 
Um, it's impressive, but equally impressive is what it will unlock, which is half a million cars this year, a million cars potentially right. next year, and then two million cars a year by the end of that period. It's just insane. It's a lot of cars. It's a lot of money. Man. Every year, every year, and again the next right. year, and uh, right. and they're growing. Right. Um, so that. Yeah. Mm, so that's gets the that investment gets the cyber truck up and going the model y and the new model y i guess because that's being re-engineered and redesigned for like from the from the pavement up i guess uh for the we'll see that in berlin uh, and also battery production in i guess berlin's getting the first 4680 battery production uh, if i understand correctly anyone Yep, that's yeah, that's true. Yep. So the forty six eighty is coming off the pilot line in California. Right. Uh, they are when the yield is good enough, uh, they will be using those those cells for you know semi truck uh, development in California. But also uh, they'll be stockpiling them and then shipping them to Berlin, right. where right. they will become part of the structural battery pack in the new Model Ys. I, under, I understood that Berlin actually is going to be making the forty six eighty there as well, right? Eventually, yeah. So those, okay. uh, those. I think it's the 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 South Korean um, uh, uh, robots and production lines that that Tesla bought will be heading to Berlin. So Berlin will be the first place in the world with a fully operational cell production line at scale, not right. the pilot. But even then, the pilot, what they call the pilot production line, is still right. one of the top ten in the world. So, right. uh, so they will be made in Berlin, and the Berlin. Uh, Model Ys will be the first cars available to the public with this technology in. That's going to be actually really great because those those Model Ys also have this is a dog. <laughs> uh, those, those, that's blue, right? Where are you going, blue? <laughs> um, okay, sorry, getting sidetracked. Uh, yeah, those Model Ys will have the uh, the one piece extruded front part and the one piece extruded back part made it to the the middle. Uh, the new battery design and everything. Okay, uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, so, but let's get on to some more things because we're running out of time. Uh, so, Tesla has uh, made some changes to their cars. So, rege regenerative braking in an electric vehicle is typically what happens when you're driving and you lift your foot off the throttle. Basically, the car's motors uh, motor has its polarity switch and it acts as a brake while producing energy and sending it back to the battery. Now, if you're, you're a fan of weak regen or the ability to select the level of this braking force, you may be saddened by this news. Uh, apparently, Tesla has removed the ability to change regen from standard, which is rather strong, to low, or some people, new drivers and people looking for ultimate efficiency for highway driving, they, they kind of prefer that low setting. So Tom, is this uh, crimping your driving style? So this one kind of baffles me. Um, it's It's been reported, actually uh, the website Electric, I gotta give them credit, is the one that broke this um, news uh, a few days ago and uh, said that some of the newer, <laughs> some of the newer uh, 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 Tesla's being delivered now don't have the ability to toggle between standard regeneration, which is the stronger regen and low, which, um, uh, reduces the amount of, of, of regenerative braking force. It still um, has liftoff regeneration. So it's not like total free road coasting, but it's, it's, it's less. Um, so the, the odd thing about it is and you see up here, we have on the screen here, Tesla actually recommends in the Model 3's like owner's manual to put the car in low when you're on icy uh, and snow covered roads because it will help prevent um, wheel slip. Because the uh, when you lift off um, and have very strong regen, you know the the the, um, the, the there's a the possibility that it, you know because it's kind of like tapping your foot on the brakes that you the, the the traction control has to work to make sure you don't have slippage. So uh, many electric vehicle owners will do this, not just Teslas. If their car can change the regen settings in the winter, they put a, put it on the less uh, the less aggressive regen setting, and and it and it it lessens the chance of the car losing uh, grip. But that's not the only reason why you might want to put it on a low setting. As you mentioned earlier, Dom, some people prefer to uh, put it on a low setting when they first get their electric car because they're not used to such aggressive regen. But those people, on many occasions, end up changing it over to the strong regen not too long after they own the car. So that in itself isn't a reason to have adjustable 
regenerative braking. But there's another reason um, uh, where uh, a few other reasons. When you're driving on long distance highway uh, dr yeah. rides, it is most efficient to coast. In, unless you have to slow down, that's when you want to have stronger regen. So many people, when they're like hypermiling and driving long distances, they'll flip the car onto low regen. I do it sometimes when I'm driving up to Vermont, um, and uh, although I drive in standard mode most of the time. Then there's another reason even where some people get motion sickness very easily while they're driving in uh, a car. And with regen on very strong, if the driver isn't careful, it's very easy to have this kind of forward and backward motion as you as you regen and accelerate. Now, the driver typically doesn't get motion sickness because their brain knows it's coming. As you lift off, as you press, your brain is processing, okay, I'm going to go this way, I'm going to go this way. But the passengers don't have that, and they get the effect a lot more. I have a good friend of mine who actually, when the first time I drove in the car with him was like, I'm getting motion sickness. I don't know if I like these electric cars. And I'm like, okay, let me do this. And I, I clicked it off. Then I was also cognizant of how I drove. And he goes, oh, that's much better after like 10 minutes. So there are reasons why people might want to toggle between a strong regen and a weaker regen. This isn't just, you know, oh, strong regen is better, which we're getting a lot of the comments on. I posted this on, in my Model 3 Facebook group. And so many people are like, ah, get rid of it. We don't need it. You know, I've never changed it. Okay, great. You've never changed it. There are reasons why other people might want to change it. So yeah. it's kind of strange that Tesla has removed it. Now, we should note, it doesn't seem to be being removed even when people have software updates on existing cars, which is strange. Um, you know, I've, I had a recent software update and, and it wasn't taken off. So nobody that has it on an existing car has seen it removed. So it's kind of weird that Tesla would have two different, um, you know, the, 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 a Model 3 that was bought, you know, four months ago has the option. A Model 3 that's delivered now doesn't. And then they all get a software update in a month or so. And the one still has it and the other one doesn't. You know, so yeah. uh, I, I don't know if it's going to go away. I don't know why Tesla did this. Nobody knows. We can't. Get, yeah, obviously, it's 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 pointless to try to reach out to Tesla. The best thing you could do is tweet Elon and say, hey, why the hell did you do this? Which mm. people are doing. I'd, right. I'd love to be able to get an answer. And, and but, you know, that's Tesla. Take the good with the bad. Is there any way that this could be a, a regulatory thing? Does that make sense? Like, you know, the whole uh, WLTP, EPA, official mileage of an ev is a minefield anyway because it depends on how you drive a car same applies to gas cars doesn't it but if you are doing official testing in a car you know what what are the rules do you engage do you have air conditioning on do you do you have low mode or standard mode and could this be something to do with the new model years of the new cars being produced where in order to get those figures the only way to do it is to have stronger regen that is a possibility. Is a po but one of the one of the questions I have with that is I I remember a few years ago talking to BMW representatives about the i3 and about different modes. And I at the time, at least, I believed the way the, the EPA range rating at least was was that it was with um, the car was tested in how it defaulted when you got in the car, if it defaulted to. Um, a certain driving mode, then that's the mode that it was tested in. So they couldn't put it in Eco Pro mode or Eco Plus mode and get more, get, get better miles. But then people drive it in standard mode and they and they're disappointed. So the reason why so many people are saying, oh, that's because of the new EPA, the range rating, and they want to. I don't think that floats because the car does default to standard mode in, right. unless you change it. You know, or, or so so. I believe that it would be it wouldn't affect the EPA range rating. I could be wrong. Rules could have changed. They change all the time. But it makes sense that the the EPA range rating is done on how the car defaults to. Because unless you have to go in and change something and say, okay, no, I want low, it shouldn't be tested in that. But who knows? They change these regs all the time. It just seems weird to me that Tesla just took this out. And for crying out loud, if that is the reason, come out and say it. Yeah, you know. Well, maybe we can send some spies, uh, Martin. Maybe you can uh, get in touch with somebody there. Let us know if perhaps they <laughs> are going to bring it back. Maybe there's some like new hardware, breaking hardware that you know they're still working with that they have to uh, maybe you know s smooth out some problems. I don't know, Very but strange. yeah, yeah. But we should move along a little bit. Um, 
so moving away from Tesla, uh, Mini, which is part of the BMW Group, has some new all-electric vehicles coming. The company issued a press release Tuesday, which said it would continue to offer a three-door electric Mini Cooper and would add a new crossover model in the small car segment and a compact crossover. Uh, so while it sounds like these two new vehicles will also be made with uh, internal combustion engine options, the company also announced it would build a vehicle in China based on a new vehicle architecture developed from the ground up for pure e-mobility. Uh, interestingly, that will be done in partnership with the Great Wall Motor Company. Uh, so far, Tesla is the only foreign automaker in China that has been allowed to build its own factory without a Chinese company partner. And that's continuing apparently mm. so M martin this car is from your ne neck of the woods uh do you have any more insight you can share with us of these models like for, for one real quick for instance like so the the two new ones will be um both crossovers but one's in the small car segment and one's a compact um, i don't i don't really get it no, but I mean, either way, Mini doesn't mean Mini anymore. If you look right. at uh, uh, where the the, uh, the brand started, so this is interesting because the previous management, uh, who are no longer on the board of management, were talking about Mini being an all electric brand, and then the new guard are talking about, or at least the new guy in charge is talking about Mini being an all electric brand. Very interesting, talking about combustion engines not being part of the mix from the end of the decade, from 2030 onwards for new cars coming out which are electric only and that's really interesting because of course parent company bmw have their power of choice philosophy where they say to their way of doing it to customers is if you want an i3 we'll make you one uh, 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 however uh, uh, sorry an x3 uh, however you want it so if you want it with a uh, petrol, diesel, hybrid, plug-in, the power of choice, like one factory, one line, putting in the powertrain that they, they want, which is fine. Their money, they do how they, they, they need to transition over to electric, whereas the subsidiary company or their, the, the, comp the, the brand they own in Mini saying, we're going to make pure electric cars and, and we're not going to do that power of choice thing. So actually, um, if you want petrol engines in that car that you like tough because it's going to be EV only. So that's great. And it's great. Another brand talking openly about the end of burning things. Right. Um, yeah. So actually we're, we're at the hour already. So, but, so we need to speed through a few things real quick. Um, and these these new cars, I believe, are only coming out in twenty twenty four, possibly. Well, because so there's not a little little bit of mini news. So sticking with them, uh, it seems like they're going to make a take their performance trim level John Cooper Works and make it an electrified uh, performance sub brand starting in twenty twenty four with uh, with re engineered versions of the three core mo core models. Uh, which I would imagine are the three we were just talking about in this previous story, the three-door hatch and the two crossovers. Uh, it would have its own standalone model eventually, but not, not at this stage. And uh, yeah, so we'll leave that. And next, really quick, Ford has also announced that something. It's electrifying its uh, transit. That's its full-size van, not the old Econoline of old. But it's the newer, more uh, aerodynamic, streamlined, uh, you know, full size van, and that's going to be unveiled on November 12th. And it's probably going to be look pretty much like the combustion engine version with perhaps a different grill that blocks more air from entering under the hood area. Um, now, you many of you might not know this, but Ford already made an electric transit van of sorts in Cologne, Germany. The company produced a, an electric box truck that's based on the transit chassis, chassis for a street scooter, a German company. And those are sold to like, the, I think the postal service there and uh, some, some other uh, like delivery type companies. And, and, and that's not to be confused all either with the Transit Connect Electric that Ford made from 2010 to, 20, to uh, 2012 with Asia Dynamics or kind of an iffy vehicle. Uh, no, this is a full size van. Ford has an agreement to produce an, an electric version of the transit oh this is the the full size one that they were making before they had no, they had an agreement to uh, produce this electric version of the transit for street scooter starting in october 2018 and uh, it put out uh, about 20 kilowatts of power 121 horsepower had a 76 kilowatt hour battery so uh, and it had a range of about 124 miles but street scooter ended up losing a lot of money and now they've they're, they're going to buy from other 
um, suppliers. So that's not an ongoing thing. So it should be interesting to see if they're actually going to use the same component configuration. You know, when this comes out, we'll see what size batteries they have, what kind of ranges they're looking at. So Kyle, do you think, what are, what are the chances are, do you think chances that's going to happen? That's going to happen. Uh, look, I'm not really sure, but what all I really want to see here is a lifted version of this big knobby tires, bed in the back, right? Little stove, uh, uh, an adventure overlanding camping version of this trans we'll That's going to that gonna be really cool. Maybe we can get somebody to work up a, a visual representation of that because that would be great. <laughs> Actually, the, um, there, there is a plug-in version of the Transit already uh, that I don't know if you get, but we certainly get. does 35 miles of range. It's got some, it's got some uh, kind of geofencey stuff where it knows it's going into zero emission cities and it'll turn on the, um, uh, the, 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 the battery or turn off the motor. Uh, rather, that's on sale now. So, But it's a, bit, it's a bit of a compromise too far. I don't think too many companies, because uh, it's expensive as well have gone for the plug-in hybrid transit uh but an all-electric version would be so good for those those deliveries that we're all getting more of uh these days right, right. it could be interesting to see if they actually take um components from the um, uh mustang mark e and, and put it into this I'm kind of curious how they're i mm. mean or its approach to electrification has been a little ad hoc they've got like a an meb vehicle from volkswagen they've got a rivian uh, SUV, they've got their Mustang mach -E, and they've got this, I mean, it's kind of like all over the place, you know, where most other, a lot of other places are like GM and Volkswagen, you know, are developing a platform and then building a, a you know, a series of vehicles on that platform. Uh, but anyway, so moving along, speaking of new, new vehicles coming from uh, companies, uh, FCA, uh, that's, what is, Fiat, oh, I can't remember that right now. <laughs> okay, but FCA, Dodge, Chrysler, right. Um, um, their CEO, Mike Manley, recently said that Ram, that's their truck division, would have an electrified pickup truck. Now, many outlets, including the Detroit Free Press, have said it will be an electric pickup truck. But here is the exact quote from Manley. I do see that there will be an electrified Ram pickup truck in the marketplace. And I would ask that you just stay tuned for a little while and we'll tell you exactly when that will be. So it's, you know, an upcoming thing, but Tom, when you hear electrified, do you think all electric or do you think something else? Well, it certainly sounds like um, electrified is usually when a manufacturer wants to uh, promote that they're going electric, but they're really not ready to go electric. So that's, we'll I'll electrify this and we'll electrify that. Then you find out it's got 15 miles of range and it's a plug-in hybrid. Um, that said, you know, I can't, um, I can't get too excited about FCA until they show us more about um, their electrification plans. They've been, you know, kind of lagging behind the industry and uh, I don't see that changing. Uh, you know, put up or shut up, uh, Dodge, uh, Ford's coming out with their electric F-150, uh, GM's going to have the electric uh, uh, Silverado, uh, you know, if, if Dodge wants to drag their feet on this, that's fine, they, 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 they've finally built up, no, I won't say finally, it's been, it's, it, they've been building up momentum with the Ram pickup here in the U.S., the sales have been really, really good, they, they've really eaten into Ford and, and GM's uh, market, which used to dominate uh, that market, uh, you know, Dodge was a distant third, uh, but the new Rams are, are very competitive vehicles. Um, they can lose the ground that they've gained if they take too long to, to come up and electrify these vehicles. Once Ford and Chevy have their fully electric pickups out, uh, Dodge is going to look like a dinosaur. Yeah. So, okay. Um, we're really short on time. So let's, uh, let's finish it off with this uh, Polestar bit. So meanwhile, back at the Polestar Ranch, the Polestar 2, which just began deliveries uh, not so long ago, is being recalled again. Apparently, 4,586 cars suffer from one of two issues or, or both. Uh, vehicles have, uh, they could have defective inverters, or there could be an issue with high voltage coolant heaters, which... Yeah, so Pulsar will be getting in touch with owners to schedule parts replacements. So this, uh, as we said, this is already the second Pulsar 2 recall, 2,200 of them. Basically, every car that 
had been delivered about a month ago uh, or, or recalled. So it's, it's kind of interesting to note, judging by these recall numbers, that uh, Polestar have delivered a couple thousand vehicles this month. So, Kyle, are these recalls enough to uh, dampen your Polestar enthusiasm? Look, they certainly don't help. I think... Uh, you know, we really would have hoped that this wouldn't have happened, but this is their first electrified platform uh, for Volvo Polestar. Of course, Geely's been building other EVs, especially in China for a while, uh, but this is their first full battery electric. Uh, it's not off to a good start, gotta say. We have, uh, you know, recalls going, but what is really good is the car when it's working. Uh, right. So what, what I'm hoping is this is it. It's a speed bump and it goes, I hope it's not a sign of future times. Um, you know, the, the, there's no denying, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time with Polestar 1 and 2. They're fantastic. The Volvo XC40 recharge is still way at the top of the list to enter our garage. Um, and we're going to be keeping a close eye on these. None of these problems seem massive except for those that the car just shuts off in the middle of the road, right? Yeah, right. That's where, uh, you know, you can still steer, you can still brake, but you lose propulsion and it happens immediately. Uh, hopefully this will solve some of that. The software gets a little bit less glitchy and we're good to go. We're just watching, uh, you know, these uh, small-ish companies uh, work out their new platforms. It's kind of interesting. Uh, other other companies such as Tesla, I've, I've been doing this for years. So, um, right, you know, right. not that that gives them a pass, but it's just something to consider. Yeah, it's like a small car beta rollout, you know, it's like, but I, I personally, I have, you know, I don't know why, but I just have, you know, I have a lot of confidence that uh, because they have, they're backed by, you know, a huge company, they have lots of ability and lots of access to engineers. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure this will, you know, be all smoothed out and it'll be fine because it's a great car. It's a great looking car. Um, but hey, well, we're on the subject of Pulsar real quick. Uh, its parent company, Geely, is apparently building a new factory in Chongqing, China, which is not so far from where they already build, I believe, the... Polestar one, they build one on the coast, uh, and then they build another one about a thousand or so miles inland. And this is going to be this chunking is will be close to that as well. And that's going to be uh, that'll have a, a manufacturing capacity of about thirty thousand units. And we're speculating that it could be for the new Precept sports sedan, which is really sweet. And we, you know, I can't wait to say, see more about that because you know it's a yeah, it's a beautiful car. We have a bunch of stories that we're not going to be able to get to tonight today but uh yeah that's the way it goes sometimes so this brings us to the end of our show uh, i'd like to thank you all for joining us uh, if you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show you can comment on the inside evs podcast post the youtube comment section below or on the inside evs forum podcast thread uh, don't forget you can find and follow our panelists here on twitter tom is at tomalog uh, martin is that EV News Daily? Kyle is that out of spec? And I'm at Dominic underscore Y. There you go. You can see it on your screen there. Uh, click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all next week. Ciao.